Okay, great. That should be it. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. And it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Daniel Barretta to give uh, this, this uh, December's uh, chair's lecture, the final one of, of the, the calendar year. So just a few notes on, on Dan. Uh, Dan received the BSc in, in microbiology and biochemistry from the University of Victoria, uh, and then a PhD in physiology and cell biology here at the U of A. Uh, where he became interested in comparative model systems and fish health. Dan received a PDF in medical immunology at the University of uh, Pennsylvania School of Medicine in 2003, and then was recruited back to the U of A in 2006 as the first cross appointment between the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Adels. Since 2006, Dan has secured over $10 million in research grants, published 78 peer-reviewed articles and mentored over 75 trainees in fundamental and applied projects and so he's been extremely active. In addition to research and innovation awards, Dan has received a number of teaching awards including an Inspirational Instructor Award and the University of Alberta Provost Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. So extremely well-rounded and I'm, I'm very pleased to have Dan here with us today. Just as a quick reminder, uh, our next his lecture will be on January 12th, and that will be from uh, Dr. Greg Goss. And so as we get started, Dan, the floor is yours. It's being recorded, and I think everything should be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I don't get to do that. No. <laughs> so I really want to do it. All right, folks, can you see me okay from the, from the computers in your own offices or homes? So I want to make sure everybody can hear me and see everything okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Amra. All right, folks. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I've been uh, at home working and trying to get things done, and it hasn't been as efficient as I would like to be for the last couple of years. And I've also missed out on, on this kinds of interaction. So I'm really happy to be back here and see a couple of uh, friends and, and colleagues. So let me start uh, to give you a little bit of a perspective on, on, on the value of fever. So this is me many years ago. Um, and I brought this up because I grew up in a fairly medically oriented family. My dad was a surgeon. My mom was an eMERGE nurse. And it wasn't unusual for us to talk about the latest uh, trauma case at, at dinner or for my dad to actually steal a chicken leg from my mom when she was making dinner and teach me how to uh, do a nice stitch. Because of course, every eight year old needs to be able to do a clean stitch, right? <laughs> so, but because of this, of this environment, I had a very discreet way that I dealt with health and disease. If you got sick, you treat. So if you got scraped, you took an ointment and you put it on your, on your skin and you were able to hopefully prevent infection. Perhaps you put something with a surfer drive uh, if you had a tummy ache, you took something for your, for your stomach. If you had fever, you inhibited it using aspirin if it was nice and light, or if it was something a little bit more abrupt, long lasting, uh, you took ibuprofen. So it was a very discreet way of dealing with disease or at least the symptoms of disease. Now, the reality is that that's the way that most people approach uh, fever. Uh, you know, NSAIDs are very prominent uh, and over the counter. They're one of the most commonly used drugs in the world. Uh, so it's, it's something that is still done to this day. So you can imagine my surprise when I went and sat in my, one of my first lectures in biology at UVic. Um, Ted might actually have had the, first, the same lecture. And I started learning about the broad conservation for this biological mechanism by the name of behavioral fear. So, and as it turned out, it was that we have uh, a process that gets initiated after infection. And this is not just happening on mammals and other warm blood invertebrates. It actually happens across the animal kingdom. So animals will actually risk predation. They will actually uh, decrease their reproductive su success in order to be able to exert these behaviors. Whereas mammals and, and the birds can do it metabolically, so they can actually increase the metabolic rates and increase the temperature that way, the core body temperature. 
other organisms actually have to go into these warmer environments to be able to exert this fever response. So reptiles will go into a warm rock and sit there for a bit. Uh, the same thing with amphibians. Fish will actually swim to the warm side of the pond and, and remain there for a number of hours until they are able to return back to more normal temperatures. And the reason that they do this, and that, or at least this is what was known until, until about mid 70s, is that this actually confers a survival advantage. Okay? So at least in the moderate case, this actually allows for these animals to survive for longer. Okay? So the big question came, and this is something that I didn't tackle for many years after, until I got back to the U of A. But essentially you have the situation where animals will go through a great length to be able to exert this fever response. It doesn't so much happen in our case, but like I mentioned before, you have these animals that will actually risk predation, risk reproductive success. And um, here we go a few years, fast forward a few million years, and we now are trying to inhibit fever at their first sign. Okay, so the question is, what are we actually giving up by inhibiting fever at the first signs of this increase in cold water temperature? So we decided, uh, or I decided on a bright Saturday morning to actually bug Keith Tierney many years ago. And he happened to be in the office, so he was kind of stuck with me for a few hours. Uh, but essentially, we got into the situation of trying to figure out a better way to be able to look at fever. And the reason that I wanted to do it in a different way was because there were a few very specific considerations that we wanted to be able to, to keep in mind. One is we wanted to have host-driven dynamic thermoregulation. And by that, I simply mean that I wanted to ensure that the induction of the fever response and the resolution of this fever response, this increase and decrease in temperature were actually host-driven. In other models, the way that it was done was simply you increase the temperature of the enclosure for a set amount of time. Alternatively, you may be able to uh, increase or decrease the entire environment. Uh, you might be able to uh, elicit fever with LPS, uh, but again, you regulate that temperature in, in different ways, either before or after when it naturally would happen. So what I really wanted to make sure was if you actually provided that stimulus, that immunological challenge, you were able to actually increase the temperature and decrease the temperature based on those natural heating and cooling mechanisms uh, that these animals provide. So that was number one. Number two, I've worked with mice, rats, humans, pigs, chickens, fish, you know, agnathans. And as it turns out, fish and goldfish, which is actually what I started my PhD with, um, turned out to be the better model to look at this. And the reason for this, as you probably know if, if you've been kids and had goldfish uh, as kids, is they're very hardy. And they're actually very good at being uh, at surviving in a broad range of temperatures. In the environment, I think in a natural environment, they go from about 1.3 to about 34.5 degrees Celsius. So that issue of changing cold body temperature and creating stress wasn't really as prominent there with the goldfish as it would be with humans uh, or mice, where you actually change by one or two degrees and you can create significant physiological stress. Okay, so we wanted to minimize that physiological stress. The third thing is we wanted to focus on moderate rather than severe pathological fever. Because unfortunately, severe pathological fever is A, not as common, and B, it actually has other additional mechanisms that are trying to now save that host from death. <laughs> uh, in our case, I just wanted to deal with what we typically see. And the last point here is it needed to be transient and self-limiting. So basically this would be a self-resolving fever response, which means that animal would be able to induce it, and inhibit it on its own through the mechanisms that I talked about before, uh, the heating and cooling. Okay, so we focused on this. The second step was this idea that we needed to be able to have a better enclosure to achieve this. And this is the way that it was done before we started this work. Uh, basically, you have this uh, conventional enclosures that are connected by uh, by these bridges, so this shuttle box approach. approach. You have uh, cooler temperatures here, you have 
higher temperatures there. And essentially what these animals are able to do is essentially migrate from the cooler temperatures to the warmer temperatures in order to exert this behavior of fever response. Here's the problem. These animals have their own personalities and they don't all like to do the same things. Fish sometimes like the corners, sometimes they like the upper parts of, of this water column. Sometimes they just prefer warmer temperatures and they would actually, based on dominance and other parameters, they would actually end up distributing themselves through these enclosures and essentially what you end up with at the end is a change in the relative positioning of these animals within this overall enclosure. So you can say 20% of the animals were here versus 23% versus 25%, but you didn't really get something that was very homogeneous. Okay. So this preference for cover, swim depth and activity level uh, obviously affected these results and it made the results a lot harder to, to decide. So we took the plunge, and this is where Keith was fantastic. He actually had a colleague uh, in Europe that, that had done uh, some of this work before, not with fever, but with other applications. Uh, and we took this and, and, and ran, and as it turned out, it took a lot longer for us to be able to optimize this enclosure. It took us probably about four and a half or so years to be able to do it, um, which was a lot longer than we had originally predicted. But let me see if I can, I can do the project. So essentially, just to give you an uh, orient you on, on how this enclosure works, is you have three concentric rings. So you have an outer ring. In this case, you can see how water flow will go from the outer ring through the middle ring to the inner outflow. And essentially, what you're able to do then is you have com compartments here that are that have a physical barrier. You have a compartment here that has a physical barrier, but that middle ring where the fish will actually swim through does not have a physical barrier at all. So the only thing that is changing uh, for this fish is the temperature. So it's, it allows the fish to really just move solely based on the thermal preference that they have. Yeah. So this is a schematic for this. We, uh, we decided to use a 10 degree uh, gradient. And here we have me actually stealing the food die from my daughter's uh, cupboard uh, to be able to actually figure out if the fluid dynamics were okay. So she couldn't get, make, get to make cupboards that day. But essentially what we did is we literally brought that die, put it in the outward on the outside chambers, saw it migrate across and through into the, into the uh, outflow. Now, part of the reason that this took so long to actually get right is because the other thing that we wanted to achieve here and you might appreciate it here, is if you're able to put one temperature here and one temperature there, is you can still have very discrete thermal zones, but a very abrupt change. So even though you still have a gradient, you don't have a gradient in that particular place, which might actually spook a fish that is trying to go across because fish are finicky and they can do that. So we actually spend a lot of time actually creating mini gradients between each of these thermal zones, just by regulating fluid dynamics, water flows, and and so that allowed us to be able to then have eight distinct thermal zones, but each divided by a very small grade, mini gradient that prevented this, this fish from getting spooked. Okay, so that was big hurdle number one. Big hurdle number two is unfortunately we deal with, well, not unfortunately, this is actually very much a good thing. Our facilities allows for flow through water. And that is a beautiful thing from health and from all these other parameters that prevent us from, the, uh, from being able to look at immunology in a, in a certain way. But the one challenge is to be able to keep a, stir, a stable thermal gradient that has eight distinct zones for 14 days in a flow through system. <laughs> so that was a tremendous challenge to be able to deal with. And I, and I have to really give props to, to Mike Wong who was on, uh, my master student at the time. And he actually ended up devising this gravity fed system that allowed this water to be able to be a little bit more consistent and kept that, that water flowing at a consistent rate. And he got some beautiful data. But since then, we've actually been able to upgrade and, and be able to do it more automatically, which is great. So that was that. Uh, and we were able to do it first for 72 hours when we were using a Simonson uh, model, which is really a fungal mimic 
So it was a shorter time period. And then in this case, you're seeing the stability that we were able to achieve uh, for 14 days when we're actually looking at an actual infection, in this case, a continuous mucosal infection uh, with a bacteria, in this case, their own as pneumonia. Okay. Then, obviously, these fish are swimming, these fish are migrating, they're going through various thermal zones. We have to be able to record it. And we have to be able to record it through day and night cycles. So we got into the IR, IR camera uh, you know, business. We got into uh, different tracking software. Uh, we ended up uh, choosing this EthoVision software, which many people have used before. And it works well for some things, but it did not work for us. Because unfortunately, one is there's a few errors. And when those errors, uh, for those tracking errors happen over five minutes or an hour, it's one thing. But when they happen over 72 hours or 14 days, you have a lot of students going through these movies three, four times, which is completely unrealistic. So we had to go beyond this. And we, that's how we got eventually into machine learning, which is something that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. OK, so that's that. So just to summarize here, then, we were able to optimize a number, a number of, of key variables. We uh, improved the fluid dynamics. Uh, we created these eight distinct thermal zones. We had the sustained differential temperatures for these individual zones. And we first did it for 72 hours, then we went progressed to 14 days. We had equivalent gradients. And you can see here in a thermal camera how these mini gradients actually developed. We have one thermal zone here, one thermal zone here, and one mini gradient between those two thermal zones. Okay. Again, to prevent those fish from getting spooked. And then we uh, created this continuous monitoring through the day and night cycle. So we we're able to look at this over the entire uh, disease process. And then because we're recording for a long time, and because we're trying to do a high resolution to actually be able to record and, and document all these different changes in behavior, uh, we had to figure out how to manage big data sets because we are recording at about one gigabyte per second. And when you're recording for a day or 14 days, that becomes a lot, <laughs> okay? So we're not quite at, 30, at 93 terabytes per day. We've been able to compress it. And my students as well, obviously, they're constantly walking around with hard drives and with a lot of pages. Okay, so just to show you here then again, three concentric, concentric rings, one middle ring where there's no physical barriers, and then the fish are able to swim through that. And that'll become quite relevant in just a second. Okay, okay. so that's, that's the enclosure. Then we decided we needed a good model to be able to look at this. We started, uh, as I briefly mentioned before, with what's called a Simonson fungal mimic, uh, which essentially allows us to be able to look at this fever response for about 72 hours. But that was a mimic. So we wanted to actually go into a natural infection process, which is what I'm showing you here. And what we decided to go uh, into was this Eremonas mucosal cutaneous uh, model. A, because uh, it's something that we have worked on in the past. B, because we have a couple of collaborations that allow us to be able to then build on these mucosal responses to be able to look at things like IgT, antibody production, and whatever else. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this model. Essentially, you have a few advantages. One is you're able to have this, uh, this nice. Is everything okay? Yeah, because it's going to move this. Okay. So, the, uh, so you essentially create a, 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 surface, a surface scratch, and then you either put saline, uh, sterile saline, or aeromonas on the surface. And over time, this, this pathogen develops. The nice thing about it is it remains within the skin surface. There is precedent for it actually going into locations like the kidney, but it's actually uh, primarily localized within that skin furuncle. So it allows us to quantitate and be able to look at things like loads and, and bacterial shedding. And the other nice thing about it is that the, the disease process takes about 14 days. Now, right here, I'm only showing you the, um, the, uh, the static acclimated thermal conditions. So essentially it's where the fixed temperatures are, which is why the wound is still quite active. But as you will see later, it actually closes quite nicely by 14 days under fewer conditions. So just to give you a heads up. Okay, so that's the, so we have the enclosure, we have the bacterial infection model. And then what we wanted to be able to do 
is pair what was happening in terms of behavior and pair what was happening in terms of that bacterial uh, infection with things that were happening inside that fish. And luckily for us, we've, we've been doing this for a number of years and we can do things like you inject or you inoculate this, this uh, host with a particular challenge. In this case, this is some work again with that Samson model, but we can do the same thing with Aeromonas. And essentially we can look at how the cells respond at the site of challenge. We can see how they produce various cytokines and molecules that activate the, the tissue around them. We can see that actually that affects distal tissues, uh, the hematopoietic compartment, which is actually the one that contains the stem cells and makes the various immune cells how it releases those stem cells, uh, sorry, how, how it releases the, the, the cells that develop from the stem cells. So whether it be a neutrophil, whether it be monocytes or whatever else released into circulation, we can see how they're either de novo created or whether they're actually released from stores. And then we can see them migrate into the challenge site and exert their antimicrobial functions. So we can look at many of these mechanisms, not just at the cellular level, but also can look at them at the molecular level then by doing things like qPCR, uh, most, most recently are missing. Yeah. And the last bit uh, to note here is we can look not only at the activation of these responses, but we can actually look at how they get resolved. And one of the things that we've been able to see, for example, that was quite novel at the time, was that cells that historically have been perceived to be big killers like neutrophils actually will change their phenotype into a more resolving state. So they actually contribute not just to the induction, but also to the resolution of that inflammatory process, which is great. So we had the enclosure, we had the bacterial model, and we had ways to be able to look at how that actually affects the host inside. Okay, so let me show you how this actually looks like. That. Okay, and this is pictorial, uh, and what I'm gonna show you in a second is actually the movie. So I just wanted to give you a summary orientation. Okay, so what you're going to see it's essentially you have the ATPT, which is we uh, call the donut tank, and you can see why. Um, you have the, the outflow here, which is the same thing there. And what you're going to see is you have uh, the lower temperatures on this end, the higher temperatures here. There's a 10 degree uh, gradient. And you'll see different phases as this disease process uh, progresses. Okay. So let's start with the first one. This is the earliest phase. So after inoculation, that those fish will actually behave very much like PBS or saline uh, treated fish. Okay, so they'll actually be quite happy. Let me just show you here. Okay, so you can see those. This is again lowest temperature, highest temperature. So 16 degrees, 26 degrees, and what you see is the fish doing exactly what fish do. They're heterogeneous in terms of their behavior. They like to explore. Some of them like have warmer temperatures, some of them like cooler temperatures, uh, but all in all, they look very nice and happy. Okay. So this is, this is in real time, just to show you a 30 second clip of how they're behaving. And there's really no preference for a particular temperature other than the fact that, the fact that they're remaining primarily on the cooler side of the pond, I guess. Okay. And there's also no signs of that. So let's go here. Okay. This is now a little bit further along. Look at where they are. Okay. So you have the situation now where you have a more, a higher thermal selection preference for, for warmer temperatures, and there's more homogeneity in their thermal preference. And you're starting to see those early signs of lethargy. So they're not moving as much. They're kind of doing the same thing that we are when we get fever. You kind of sit down and lie on the couch and just sit there for a little bit. Now, this is what happens at the peak of fever. This is, you can see the water flowing, so when you know it's, it's not a steel. <laughs> this is 30 seconds, and they do this for hours. This fish will go to that warm side of the pond, and they will just stay there. Okay, so remember that those, those uh, early enclosures that I was telling you about and how homogeneous, how heterogeneous it was? When you take all that away, it becomes very, which, which is good. And then after, once we realized that the fish actually weren't dying, um, we recognized that they go through a resolution stage and they go back to that original heterogeneous behavior based on their own personalities and they primarily start selecting those cooler temperatures. Okay, so you have this situation where 
They infect the fish, they will go through a lag phase, they will induce a fever response, they'll go through a very homogeneous, homogeneous uh, higher, higher thermal preference, which is also matched with lethargy behaviors, and then they will resolve that response. And this is what it looks like uh, when we plot it out. So luckily we're able to do this with fairly high resolution. We are, we're working at a, a per second resolution here is just graphed on a per hour basis just because otherwise there'd be way too many points. But essentially what you can see is, is quite easy to, to see, which is one, there's differences between those fish that are treated with aromonas or control. Okay, so there's a higher thermal preference. And the more important part is that there's a very discrete period for this higher thermal preference. Okay. So they start about the same as control and they end about the same as control. But there's a very discrete period between day one and day eight where there's a higher thermal preference. And that is matched with a lower rate of, of uh, swimming, which is in this case shown by the, amount, the velocity that they swim at and the number of transitions across the various thermal zones. You have over 100 when they are under sailing conditions, they have nearly zero when they are infected with the hormones between that fever up period. After that, it goes back up. Okay. okay. And these two new uh, lethargy uh, associated metrics are very much consistent with what we experience and you guys have probably experienced when you had fever. So that immobility, fatigue, and illness. Now, this is one of my favorite graphs. And, and it is because it shows how homogeneous this response is. So let me start with heterogeneous one. Sailing controls, this is the variance in the behaviors, okay? Huge variability throughout the entire infection process or mock infection process because it's sailing in that case. Look at what happens under the aromonas response. It starts heterogeneous, but between that day one and day eight, those become highly homogeneous. Now they, thing to actually highlight here as well is whereas those videos that I showed you were groups, these are actually fish that have been placed individually in that tank, sometimes weeks apart. So these are now per population of fish that you stick in a tank by themselves. And despite the fact that they are separated by weeks away, they'll still behave exactly the same way between day one and day eight. And the same thing happens on the lethargy side of things. Very consistent lethargy uh, between day one and day eight. So now that we had the behaviors, we decided to, to make sure that this was an actual fever response. And in order to be able to show that this is a fever response, you need to be able to show A, that there is CNS engagement. So the central nervous system is engaged and B, that there's actually a systemic response as well. So this is what's showing here. Um, let me see if I can here. So you have the induction of pyrogenic molecules such as IL-1 and TNF, and heat shock proteins such as protective factors like HSP7 and I. Now, just to orient you which groups we're looking at, you have in blue the static 16. So those are fish that have been kept under fixed thermal conditions on the cooler side of things. We also included a group that was under static 26 degrees, which was the maximum temperature selected by this fish, but it was essentially kept static. And this in red are those fish that were allowed to be able to migrate back and forth between the various different temperatures as much as they wanted. Okay. And the take home message here is that essentially under static low thermal conditions, there's really very little to no engagement of that CNS. Under high, static 26 degrees, there's some engagement and under dynamic conditions, there's really good engagement of that CNS with very unique kinetics, okay? So that's on the CNS. Then we look systemically at the, at the uh, PGA2 in circulation and we find that under those dynamic conditions, you get significant engagement of that PGA2 pathway, not under 16, not under fixed 26. And one of the uh, recurring themes that you're going to be noticing is there's a number of these mechanisms that are engaged under fixed thermal conditions at the higher temperatures, but not all of them. So temperature alone has an important role to play here, but it's not the same as fever, okay? So hyperthermia and fever are two 
very distinct things. This last graph, and I apologize to the guys here because you can't really see the axis uh, because of the Zoom chat, but essentially it is the comparison of the thermal preference when you actually add an antipyretic. So you have in, in here, the, what happens on the high thermal preference when you have that dynamic temperature, which is what we were talking about before. And here's what happens when you have that either control or uh, that addition of an enzyme. So we're able to inhibit fever using an antipyretic just the same way as we can in humans. And in fact, the control like that was used here was used at the same concentration as it's used in humans and had the same kinetics of, of, uh, of development of this. So it lasts for about six to eight hours and is able to work quite nicely. And after that, it becomes more mature. All right. So that was engagement of the CNS, engagement of the, of the uh, circulatory system. Here we're looking at the migration of those cells into that challenge set. So remember the subcutaneous mucosal infection. And what my PhD student Amro has shown very nicely here through an HNE stain is that you have this capacity to be able to recruit cells and you do so much more effectively under those dynamic or static 26 degree conditions. So the peak of white blood cell infiltration into the site happens at about 24. It happens, starts quite early and well before that static 16. These guys are not showing any real white blood cell infiltration until about this time away. Now, the other important point to make is this is not a stronger response. It's just an early response. And the reason that that's important is we're not just hyper activating the immune response. We're not increasing too much inflammation. We're not creating the collateral tissue damage that's associated with that. We're just moving it earlier. And for a bacteria that tends to proliferate quite quickly, this is a good thing. You're just attacking it earlier. So it's an earlier, not a stronger response. Okay. So this uh, tackles the, the, uh, the antimicrobial responses that happen once the white blood cells get to the site. And the other reason that I put this up is because historically, the immune systems of fish has been considered to be fairly substandard compared to ours as mammals, okay? which always bugged the bejesus out of me. And the reason for that is because we simply do not understand enough about the immune responses of these animals. And in this case, what I'm showing is that fever is not about globally inducing an immune system global response. It's actually about targeting specific antimicrobial responses that are actually able to exert the functions that you want. So in this case, we first looked at the production of reactive oxygen intermediates, and we were surprised by the fact that those fish in blue here that were held at static conditions did the same thing that they've always been doing in every paper that we've ever looked at in microbial responses, which is they create ROS. Okay, so they're able to produce reactive oxygen species, whereas those febrile fish actually were really depressed when it came to them. So we're like, okay, how does that work? So we looked then at this nitric oxide production, which is a complementary way to be able to uh, achieve antimicrobial responses. And in that case, you have a significant upregulation under fever conditions, both at the protein as well as the gene level. So what this tells you is that this fever response is not globally upregulating those immune responses, it's actually selectively inducing, in this case, nitric oxide versus a respiratory growth response. And that goes contrary to what the earlier speculations were as to how fever works, which is increased metabolically, uh, which leads to global upregulation of fever. So then, of course, we want to make sure there's more antimicrobial mechanisms. We want to know that they actually kills, and the reality is that it does. So you have a very significant killing of this bacteria, clearance of, of the infection under dynamic conditions, whereas under static conditions, it takes a lot longer. And I just want to give you a sense of how cool this is, okay? We're not increasing clearance by 10, 20%. We're clearing in half the time and we're adding no additional drugs. So these fish are clearing this infection in seven days instead of 14 days. And they do so even though this bacteria actually grows better at higher temperatures. 
thing. So it's not just that the bacteria doesn't like the temperature, it's that this host is actually killing them much more effectively because it's able to dynamically reach those temperatures. So obviously at the site of infection, just like in the CNS, you have a regulation of these various cytokines. But the real point that I wanna highlight here is that one, those 16 degree fixed fish are actually still able to induce an immune response, but it happens later. And it's much more sustained. It actually lasts for longer. Okay? And that will become relevant as we start talking about damage, collateral damage later. The second thing that I wanna highlight is this static 26. So the higher thermal temperature and the dynamic conditions are actually able to engage various cytoprotective tissue repair mechanisms. So you have TGA beta, VEGF, uh, and not so much for IL-10. Okay. So you are able to very early engage those potentially uh, beneficial, beneficial responses in the context of tissue repair mechanisms. So of course, we decided to look at this, or we decided to look at what happened. And this is now seven to 10 days. So the earlier histology that I was showing you was just for the first 48, 72 hours. Here is now day seven, day 10. And it's pretty apparent. Okay. If you have an aeromonas infection and you look at dynamic fever conditions, your tissue looks beautiful. Okay. You still have those muscle cells that are nice and happy. There's not much for any white blood cell infiltration left. Uh, there's not much for exudate. There's not much for damage. This looks terrible. <laughs> okay. Same seven days, but your muscle cells are done. You have uh, still quite a bit of white blood cell uh, remaining there. You have exudate. And then by day 10, you have significant necrosis of the cells. Okay. Whereas by day 10, those dynamic fish are actually looking very much like that mock infected fish that got injected with seed. How does this look like at the surface? And you have no idea as to how many fish we went through this to be able to create the entire panel and how many times AMRO had to actually repeat it to be able to have nice pictures. So please, I'm gonna keep this for just a little bit longer just so you can <laughs> appreciate how pretty it is. But essentially what you should be able to note is that A, those early signs of inflammation happen primarily under those, those static 26 degree conditions and that those dynamic conditions. Okay, so that early purulent exudate happens at day two, whereas it takes all the way to day four to be able to show up at that static 16 degrees. Okay, so that's number one. The second, and this is a more exciting part, is look at the wound closure. Okay. So whereas static fish at 16, which is very similar to what I showed you originally, still have a significant wound after 14 days, when you're talking about the, that uh, dynamic febrile condition is almost closed. And the static 26 is about intermediate. So consistent with what I was telling you before, there's some benefits to increasing the temperature, but it doesn't recapitulate absolutely everything. That food does. So we went back inside, and in this case, we're looking at uh, the capacity of this tissue to be able to uh, repithidize. So you have the epithelial layers here, you have a really nice layer compared to what static conditions do. This is by day three. And the other thing that you should be able to note, and this is in blue, the level of collagen deposition, you have this very early response by day four under dynamic conditions, which you cannot see in the other two groups. By the time you get to day seven, it's very organized. Whereas even though it's starting to develop at static 26, it's still quite disorganized. And by day 14, not only do you have that collagen deposition, which is critical to that tissue repair process, but you also have the development of those cells that produce that mucus. So not only do you have the repair of that tissue, but you actually have the rest restoration of that functionality of that tissue. Okay? So it's not just about creating a scar, it's about actually getting that mucus to, start, uh, to be uh, produced at that site. So not only do we establish the, the barrier integrity, but also the function. Okay, so with this then, basically we have increased pathogen killing, which means we have better infection control. Then after this pathogen is killed, 
uh, fever is able to control that inflammation, which is obviously important for improved energy management. Not so important for us because we can go to the fridge and pick up a sandwich, but for these animals where energy is limiting, it becomes a real important. And then third, uh, thirdly there, we have that contribution to wound repair, which is important not just from being able to move beyond that first infection, but also be able to prevent those secondary infections that will come in if that wound to continue to do it. Okay. So just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, fish display a broad range of personalities and swimming patterns, yet this changed to remarkable consistency during the free well response. Accelerated pathogen clearance, even though those pathogens grew better at higher temperatures. This was paired with mechanisms that improved inflammation and contributed to tissue repair. And static higher temperatures did offer some benefits, but did not recapitulate all the benefits that we got through that dynamic shift in, in uh, core body temperature to fever. Okay. Okay, on time. Okay. So with that, so I showed you the Ramona's model. But one of the important things here is that, again, going back to that idea that fish, the fish immune system is not, is, is underdeveloped, uh, this shows you the opposite. Okay? Essentially, what you have is not just a fever response that is nice and consistent with the hormonas that contributes to the development or the, the restoration of, of function by 14 days, but then you have a custom response that is very different to a different Trigger. So in this case, Samosin, this is that fungal mimic that I told you about. It is just, in this case, a very consistent response from this point to about 22 hours. Okay. So those fever responses are actually customized depending on this pathogen and depending on the species of fish that you, that you actually are targeting. And that's some work by my master's student, Varek. Uh, So how do we apply this? So one of the, one of the things that, that I, I wanted to do, and this is something that I was gonna do in my sabbatical, but COVID unfortunately kicked me in the butt. Um, so we partly were able to start this. And this is being able to look at this actually in nature. So CCMI uh, is, is uh, the place that we have a collaboration with in the Caymans. And essentially lionfish, uh, it's an inv invasive species there. But one of the beautiful things about lionfish is they're very territorial. So they remain within a squ one square kilometer of the area that they're actually residing in. So what we're planning on doing, and this is where that stitching that I learned when I was eight actually will come in really handy, is actually scuba, catch these guys, put in a trigger, uh, basically put in you know, a pathogen mimic such as Amazon, be able to actually put a, a bit of a, of a transmitter and then be able to stitch them up and let it be. And what they're going to be able to actually do, hopefully, is migrate to the various areas within this one square kilometer and show that this actually happens in nature. So that's, that's something that we're trying to do there, both with, with CCMI as well as St. Andrews, uh, St. Matthews. Okay. So if anybody has uh, expertise with uh, receivers or tags, I'd be happy to talk to them because that's well outside of my area of expertise. And what we would like to be able to do is actually capture as much data as possible because unfortunately, these tags are going to swim away with those fish after my gut. Yeah. So the, there are a number of things that we would like to do, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of them depending on how much time I have left. But essentially, it is this idea that we can actually take this and improve animal health. And the stuff that I'm going to show you is primarily going to be on fish, but we're actually trying to apply this to a number of other species. Lo and behold, species such as birds can actually benefit quite a bit from this. So we're actually applying it to poultry through my ales connection. Uh, but the very important part here is that we're not actually trying to create new functionalities in the immune system of these animals. We're simply trying to take advantage of a natural strategy that has been going for over 500 million years of evolution, which I think is a beautiful thing. And, and in fact, allows us, it's in the context of, of, uh, of fish health and aquaculture, it's actually been really paramount to us to be able to communicate with coastal communities because it's a very easy conversation when you don't have to put in new chemicals or new antibiotics or whatever else. So it's actually really helped us there. Okay, so 
I'll tell you that in a second, John. <laughs> um, so yeah, the acclimation, uh, acclimation temperature does play an effect and I'll, I'll come back to that. So some of the benefits uh, don't have to be really that complicated. Uh, things as simple as being able to restore that tissue barrier integrity after vaccination. There's a lot of secondary infections and uh, fungal infections, particularly after IP inoculation in aquaculture, which we should be able to help deal with. Um, we have also a salmon restoration project that we uh, were starting with uh, Brian Dixon and a couple others in, in, uh, on the east side of things. And we wanted to be able to uh, essentially make for a better transition as this fish went from the hatchery setting into the river environment. And perhaps even something as simple as decreasing the stress of these animals as they're making this transition may actually allow us to go beyond the very low percentages of fish that are salmon that are actually returning to the rivers, which is pretty, pretty bad. Okay, so let me go back to this, to this customer responses that I was telling you before. Okay. So this is work again by Farah. Uh, she's been able to, well, she's spent a lot of time looking at this. And, and the amazing part to me is that these fever responses are, are, can be customized not only based on the stimulus, but also on the species. So in this case, you have the kinetics for, for goldfish, uh, in this case, the kinetics for, for rainbow trout to two different, to two different immunological stimuli. And you have different times for each of these, okay? The other thing that we realized here, though, is that we could actually segregate these responses. And we can look at various ways to be able to separate those fish that are, that are either showing that behavior versus those fish that are not showing that, that high thermal preference behavior. And the reason that that's important is because that essentially told us that perhaps fever is also contributing to the decreased spread of disease across the population. And because those fish that remain in a particular location will be separated from the others. But we don't actually know that for a fact because the other fish might actually come and uh, hassle those fish. Okay. So the question is, are distinct fever of behaviors conserved in mixed group settings? And I have another student of mine, Ethan Proctor, that's working on this. And essentially what he did here is he looked at a single fish that was infected or challenged. And you'll see it pop up in red. And that's among a whole bunch of fish that are not. And what you see is that fish went from a higher thermal preference to the highest thermal preference, largely not caring what the other fish around him is doing, even though they continue to bump into it. <laughs> so this is about 24 hours compressing about 30 seconds. That's why they're swimming so quickly. But essentially what it tells you is that that fever response appears to be conserved even in mixed populations. So that's activation of fever reduced disease transmission. And this is what uh, Ethan is looking at. And the question is, if we inhibit fever, does this actually contribute to the system? So this actually yield, uh, led to uh, another problem that we had to do, and that was this issue of being able to now track not just an individual, but to track multiple individuals. And this is with that machine learning algorithms that, that Ethan and uh, a couple of my other folks are working on came into play. So this is, what I'm gonna show you here is just fish normally swimming. This is now in a new enclosure. I don't have time to go over that enclosure, but essentially now you have to switch into the tracking of multiple fish in real time. And there's been a lot of work that's, that's gone into this because obviously these were not commercially available. Uh, you'll see in, in two cases where fish are actually crossing. And in one case, the identity of that fish, so the machine learning algorithm is actually able to, to conserve that, that, uh, that label. So that's a good, a good result. But there's also, if, if you have good eyes, you would actually be able to see one cross where the name, where the numbers actually flipped. So that means that the training still is not quite finished. Okay, and it takes a lot of different rounds of training for this for this problems to be able to actually do a problem. Okay. So that's what Ethan is doing uh, right now. He's he's looking at, at the potential for this to uh, to affect disease transmission. And my postdoc Asif was actually working not just in fish, but actually trying to be able to apply this to, to chickens. And I'm not gonna go into this other than to say, and this is, this is the beautiful part of this, 
is after you spend $120,000 on a camera to be able to look at this in fish, you can actually do this with a GoPro camera that costs $500. <laughs> so, what, so once you know what you're doing, you can actually do it in a very cost-effective way. Okay? And the other thing is you can do it in those mixed environments where you have different backgrounds and different things coming up so that those programs are actually able to, to very nicely uh, be able to tell this apart. And chickens are particularly useful or particularly noteworthy because they cannot be examined through other conventional methods. Because as you can imagine, feathers are actually really good insulators. So the typical way for, for people to actually look at where the temperatures go up or down actually doesn't work in chickens because they're insulated. <laughs> so the last thing that I'll mention here is uh, this is a, a project that we started a few years ago and it kind of got stalled a little bit due to COVID. But it's essentially some really nice collaboration where we're trying to now get a little bit more involved and trying to be able to get an idea as to whether those early innate acute inflammatory processes that are induced through fever are actually contributing also to the shaping of the subsequent adaptive response that contributes to vaccine eff efficacy and the capacity of this fish to actually visit good, potent, adaptive mechanisms. Of okay? So we have eight universities involved. We have multiple industry partners and you know, good links with, with coastal communities. And that's again, where that conversation is really, really useful because we're talking about a natural, a natural process to deal with this disease. So with that, I'm at 49 minutes, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I would like to thank the people who actually do this work day to day. Like I usually say, I'm, I'm primarily stuck in my office or at home working on grants or we're doing everything else that we need to do these days. But a lot of thanks to, to Farah and, and Amro specifically uh, because of, of setting up this, this system. Uh, Farah has spent countless hours being able to, or looking at behavioral uh, plots and, and being able to get that, that enclosure to work. Amro has been working on tissue repair. Mike Wong, who started all of this. Um, Ethan Proctor, Asif, Jeremy, and Maciel, who, who have been working in various aspects of the new enclosures were actually, I think, on the third generation, I think we're on our sixth tank. So this, there's many tanks that actually didn't make past the, the cutoff. Uh, and we have uh, multiple collaborations uh, with people not only here, Keith really helped us at the beginning, uh, Ryan helped with some of the histology early on, uh, and now in some newer collaborations with folks like Oriel at the University of Pennsylvania, Pierre Bordino at the of France, as well as Brian Dixon on the on the University of Waterloo to be able to look at this bigger projects to be able to actually see if we can contribute to some of these uh, issues that we're dealing with in the rest of these groups. Okay, so with that, I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay. Thanks so much, that's fantastic, Dan. I'm just going to, if you can stop sharing, what I can do is- um, you, you tell me what I'm doing. So- Because I have my- yep, So show. I'm- yeah. And yeah. I believe I'm okay now. I think so. Um, sure. think, yeah, on the bottom. There we go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, just so we can see. So, for those of you who are online, if you have any questions, um, uh, please uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat, and we'll see if we can get to them. And so, John, you want to ask a question again? Sorry, I, I, I didn't have a time to. So, go with that. There we go. So, uh, John's. Question, so great talk, Dan. Just wondering if acclimation temperature affects the chosen fever temperature. So the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, the, the acclimation temperature will affect the way that, that temperatures, so the, the temperature selection. Uh, and we believe that that's one of the reasons that the trout that we're currently dealing with are going to a particular temperature because of it. But the one thing to, to note here is that the thermal gradients that we've been working on are about 10 degrees both for trout and goldfish, just at a different range. And in all cases, and this is consistent with what happens in insects, it's consistent with what happens in birds, and it's consistent with what happens in humans, a fever response is an increase of about two to four degrees, regardless of the, of the challenge, regardless of the species. Uh, so it's pretty consistent. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Hello? That was really fascinating. Um, and as aquatic species having to get oxygen from water uh, and warmer water holds less oxygen, how much variation 
from the lethargy might be due to uh, trying not to be too metabolically active in the lower oxygen situation. Absolutely, and, and you bring up a really good point. It's right now we're talking about temperature and there's so many other factors that, that come into play. And I think that's one of the reasons why the dynamic aspect of this comes into play is taking a, a fish or forcing an invertebrate to go to a warmer temperature and deal with the oxygen presence or absence at that point uh, is, is quite a tall order. But if you allow for that dynamic shift, uh, it may be hopefully curtailing some of those issues. It'd be very interesting to test that with closely related organisms that yeah. are aquatic versus terrestrial, where there would not be an oxygen yeah. issue. And yeah, yeah. Put in a plug for wood lice, you know, terrestrial versus <laughs> aquatic <laughs> If you want to look at fever and wood lice, I'd be more than happy to, to help. Student Hannah would do lots of good lice. <laughs> as long as they don't stay in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> Curiosities about um, maybe your speculation on other fish species that would have different natural histories. So I'm thinking, for example, a tropical fish maybe experiences a, a less of a range of temperature in mm -hmm. its day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And then at the opposite extreme, I'm wondering about like, intertidal fish where they really can't maybe behave, uh, control behaviorally their thermal uh, fever. Yeah, so it, it's hard to speculate in terms of how they would deal with it. I think the part that puts me at ease is the fact that you only need that two to four degree change. Uh, you know, for somebody who spent a lot of time in seawater, I can tell you there's gradients everywhere that I've swam in, uh, whether it be Vancouver Island or the tropics. So you should still be able to, to take advantage of that. Now the question is to what extent do they exert it and what kind of cost benefits do they get us because of that response? I, I can't say. It's like Olaf and Aaron have yeah, um, so I saw Aaron's first and then uh, and then we'll bring in Olaf. So Aaron's does a temperature differential, i.e. letting temperature go up the same amount in birds, given they are operating at so high a temperature already, and any evidence it depends on environment. Yeah, so I don't know for wild birds, but I can give you some information in terms of chickens, which work at about a 41.5 degrees Celsius. So there is such a thing as seed stress in these animals, and they, they obviously don't respond very well to it. Uh, but one of the questions is what happens if you have either an infection going through a flock or you have a vaccine that has been administered, whether having a particular temperature range and allowing for that temperature to actually increase or the, or the chickens to interact in a certain way so that cold body temperature is able to increase actually beneficial. So, uh, Based on what we're seeing, is they do exert that fuel response. I didn't. I have some data here, but I didn't have time to show it. But essentially, they actually segregate into distinct groups for those that are infected versus those that are not infected. So, okay. And uh, Olaf, uh, are you able to come online and? Yeah, I I hope you can hear me. And I mean, I also really enjoyed the talk. And I'm interested in the individual variation um, at the behavioral level um, that you showed initially. Um, you, sh you showed that, that it's very variable before the um, infection, and then it goes down, and then it goes up again. And are the preferences that are different between individuals consistent between those three phases? And if so, does it relate to the individual susceptibility or, or the recovery speed? So I, I think that, okay, so, so let, let, me, let me say a few things. One is there's definitely different and what we call personalities within these animals and they will have different ranges that they select before and after. But as, as, as you mentioned, it goes very consistent during that febrile period. Uh, whether that's associated with the decreased or increased susceptibility, I could not tell you. That's one of the things actually that we're trying to test. Uh, and the easiest way to, to start looking at this, uh, at least in a preliminary way, is to be able to actually give different doses of the same stimulus to different animals and see if those if there's different custom responses to each of them. But we're just getting to the point where you can actually look at that level of resolution. But, mm -hmm. you know, and I hope that you noticed that there was a B in one of my pictures. <laughs> yes, I loved it. These do exert fever as well, but they do so at a, at a social level, which is fantastic. That's great. Thank you all.
I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what does that mean? Say if, if we get sick and we have a low grade fever, is it good to kind of let it run? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's the same thing that I just got asked a, a, a couple of weeks ago from somebody that's making a story on the on the work that we've done. So I've actually had a number of my students that have actually stopped using antipyretics <laughs> for better or worse. Um, I would I would say that my personal opinion is that <clears throat> I don't think we should be so quick at grabbing. And I think the pie in the sky for us is to be able to identify where that boundary is between taking advantage of other advances that we've had in medicine while still being able to still take advantage of that natural response without completely inhibiting. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that that boundary is, is where we really need to aim to go. Uh, but we're still not there. Okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you. It looks like Stan has a question for you. Dan, is there any uh, any information in the wild to tell us any idea of how frequently animals have to mount this fever response? One, and then secondly, whether when they are mounting that response, they are more or less susceptible to things like predation as well. So. There, there is uh, work done. Uh, there were a number of studies done on frogs that, that were uh, parasitized uh, and became more susceptible. But in this case, it was a mechanical disruption of their swimming patterns. So it basically made it easier for that person to be able to then get passed onto the bird host. Uh, but that whether fever was exerted or not at that point, it was not known. And to be honest, I believe that that lionfish work that we were talking about is probably going to be the first time that somebody's actually shown this in nature. Uh, if if not, I would actually like to see those studies because then we don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the lionfish is a predator in the system. I just wondered what's happening with the prey in those systems as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Long time. Yeah. Uh, so I Okay, well, if, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you, Dan, for a, a, an excellent uh, and a pretty exciting talk. So thank you so much. Oh. As a last, I'd like to offer you a uh, oh, gift, yeah, a token of appreciation. <laughs> this is a, a water bottle. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Thanks thank so you. much. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you.